In the year 2008, here in South Texas, we had our last really big hurricane, Hurricane Dolly. And it came through with much force and several feet of rain, blew the leaves off many trees. Uh, many of us were out of power and underwater for days, if not weeks. Now, Lydia and I coincidentally had taken our children to San Antonio for a little vacation. And so we were in San Antonio when Hurricane Dolly uh, moved inland. Of course, we had to wait another day or two before we could come home. But when we finally came home, we had a really hard time getting to our house out in Bayview, one of the hardest hit spots in the valley. We had to take the back roads uh, we had to drive through standing water, which is not a good idea. Uh, a, a van full of little kids. Uh, it was kind of white knuckle time. Finally getting home, we realized that uh, the wind and the rain had really done a number on our yard. We have a, a yard full of, of large trees, uh, and we live in a Rosaka. So a great deal of rain had washed through our yard and gullies and grass uprooted. Uh, trees had fallen, uh, the leaves had blown off the trees uh, that, that were still standing. The yard looked like a mess. Thankfully, the house was fine, though, so we drove into the driveway, and as soon as the car came to a stop, our, our now 17-year-old daughter, Emma, a very little girl back then, immediately started crying. In fact, she started weeping. We said, oh, Emma, Emma, it's okay. Our home is fine. And she said, yes, but it's not pretty anymore. And she was right. It was rather ugly. And over the course of the next few months, with chainsaws and trucks and manpower, we were able to clean up the yard. And then it was rather bare. But over the course of that summer and several other several summers uh, following, things grew back. The, the, the earth repaired itself. The, the, the plants rebooted. And things were made new again. And by God's common grace, that's how the earth handles great storms. Things are made new again. Do you know that a Christian ethic, a Christian teaching, says that God does the same thing in our lives? What is once uprooted and ugly is made new again. God redeems. That's the word. That means that he, he, he takes possession, ownership of you. You know, 1 Corinthians 6 says, you're not your own, for you were bought with a price. He, he, he takes ownership of you. He redeems you. Said another way, he exchanges my junk and, and my brokenness for something new, something valuable. In fact, in Revelation 21, God says, look, look, I am, I am making all things new. And the implication of this truth is great. You see, as a, as a redeemed child of God, he's making all things new in my life. As a redeemed child of God, I, I can't even screw up my life if I try. As long as I'm repenting, as long as I'm coming back to the Father, as long as I'm submitting my life to him, then that he's constantly, he's making things new. He's righting the wrong. He's fixing, repairing the broken. He is working it all together for my good. The Bible tells us that he is looking for people whom he can bless, whom he can uplift and redeem. Second Chronicles 16, it says that the eyes of the Lord, they search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. So the eye, the, God's eyes are panning the earth. And he sees you and he says, ah, there's someone who's fully committed. I will, I will strengthen that person. I will, I will sustain them. I will lift them up. The first point in today's sermon is this. The Lord has good plans for you. 
If you're a child of God, the Lord has good plans for your life, too good to really even grasp or fathom. The eyes of the Lord, he's moving to and for. He's looking for that person that he might bless. He's looking for you that he might lift you up. The Lord has good plans for your life. We've got about five or six teaching points today. They're just going to be interspersed throughout the, throughout the, 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 the lesson. So today's the story, the scripture passage. It's the last picture we have of King David. And I talk about somebody who, you know, the, God's eyes were panning the earth, looking for somebody that he might bless, like King David. Good example of that. Um, this is the, the, the last picture that we have of King David for this year, for 2021, in our study. Um, so, so I want you to see, I want you to hear the promise that the Lord speaks over King David as he's, as he's searching for someone that he might, whose heart devoted to him, he might bless them. He, he, he locks in on King David and he speaks this promise over King David. Second Chronicles chapter 17. It says, and now I declare that the Lord will build a house for you. God says, I'm gonna build a house for you, King David, but not that kind of house. A house for you, a dynasty of kings. For when you die and join your ancestors, I will raise up one of your descendants, one of your sons, and I will make his kingdom strong. And he is the one who will build a house, a temple for me, God says. And I will secure his throne forever. I will be his father and he will be my son. I will never take my favor from him. Okay, so what, 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 what God is saying is, David, I'm going to build for you a house, but not a literal brick and mortar house. I'm going to build you a legacy, a reputation, a, a dynasty. I'm going to build you that kind of house. A, a, a line, a lineage of kings. And I'm going to, I'm going to take your first son, your, your son Solomon, the, the first uh, king that follows you, uh, David. And he is actually going to build for me, God says, a temple. An actual brick and mortar place of worship. I'm going to build you a house, a dynasty, a legacy. And then your son is going to build me a temple. Verse 16, then King David went in and sat before the Lord and prayed. Ah, he says, who am I, O Lord God? And, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? What more can I say to you about the way you have honored me? You, you know what your servant is really like. For the sake of your servant, O Lord, and according to your will, you have done all these great things and have made them known. King David's just in awe that the Lord would choose to bless him in such a way. So in summary, without reading the entire chapter, God tells King David here, uh, King David, you're a man of war. This is part, the part that we didn't read. You're a man of war, so although you will not build me uh, the temple, the actual place of worship, uh, instead of that, I will build you a house, figuratively. A dynasty, your descendants will sit on the throne and, and reign over, over Israel perpetually. Uh, but it will be your son Solomon, not you, King David, your son Solomon who will build for me a temple because he's a man of peace, you're a man of war. The place of worship um, built with, with brick and mortar, stone and mortar, Solomon's going to do that. Okay, okay. Now that is a promise made in chapter 17. But, but David still has several chapters in his life, chapters in the book, uh, during which he could screw this thing up if he possibly can there's still time for david king david to screw it up fast forward therefore to chapter 21 of first chronicles and in this story we have these two characters we have king david a man after god's own heart and in contrast to him we we have joab who is his ruthless military leader, like his general, he has been for his lifetime. Joab, Joab has been King David's uh, general, a ruthless military leader who he was faithful to David. But, but other than that, like he had committed so 
many ruthless acts, atrocities in his uh, military career. The second, several times where King David just thinks of cutting Joab loose because he's just mean, ruthless. Sometimes he does things that are unethical. And so this, this next reading, it's, it's pretty bad news for King David himself. First Chronicles 21, it says that Satan rose up against Israel and caused David to take a census of the people of Israel to count all the heads. How many people am I reigning over? So David said to Joab, his general, and the commanders of the army, take a census of all the people of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north and bring me a report so I may know how many there are. But Joab replied, ah, may, may the Lord increase the number of your people a hundred times over, but, but why, my Lord the king, do you want to do this? Are they not all your descendants? Why must you cause Israel to sin? What's this? The census is going to be sinful? We'll get to that. Verse 4, but the king insisted that they take the census. So Joab traveled throughout all Israel to count the people. Then he returned to Jerusalem and reported the number of people to David. There were uh, 1,100,000 warriors in all Israel who could handle a sword and 470,000 in Judah. But Joab did not include the tribes of Levi, Levi and Benjamin in the census because he was so distressed at what the king had made him do. All right. So here, here we go. The fact that Joab didn't even want to do this, that is telling. Because again, he was a ruthless warrior, committed many underhanded, wicked acts uh, in, in, the, in the, the stories of the Old Testament. And even he, even, even ruthless Joab knew this is not a good idea. Okay, now it's worth noting that God had called the nation of Israel to take several censuses uh, in recent history. So counting the people wasn't in itself a wicked act, um, but this time it is. Somehow David had become so arrogant at this point in his life that, that this act of taking a census, of counting all the people in the nation, it was considered by God to be an evil uh, act of arrogance. In fact, the Bible says that it was a Satan ordained act. All right, so, so let's review our first point and then let's look at two more points here. The first point we looked at today is that the Lord has good plans for your life. Too, too good to really grasp or fathom. He tells us that in scripture. The second point today is that sin that seems insignificant, just counting the people, um, it, it, it isn't. It isn't actually insignificant. It, it actually is a big deal. And the fact is, Satan blinds us to the weightiness of our sin and our rebellion. And there may be sin in your life right now, some act of disobedience, uh, some consistent disobedience in your life regarding your, your actions, your thought life, your finances, the way you spend your money, the way you make your money, the way you treat people. The, some act of disobedience that you just write off as being insignificant, but the Lord sees as weighty. Because again, Satan, he, he seeks to blind us from the weightiness of our sins, to make us think that something that is a big deal isn't really a big deal. And then, and then point number three, it's, it's quite related. I wrote down, arrogance is a grave Sin. It's a serious sin. We tend to think that arrogance is like an acceptable sin, you know? Adultery or getting drunk or stealing, that would be a serious sin. But arrogance, oh, that's a lightweight sin. Well, in, in, in God's perspective, in his kingdom, it is a heavy weight. That's why the Bible says that the Lord pushes away the proud and he draws the humble to himself. Arrogance, it's a grave, weighty sin. It's, it's chilling, isn't it, to think that it's, at times Satan might cause me to commit some evil act and I don't even realize it. And what, is the, what does the Lord do in those moments in time? What we're, gonna, what we're about to see is this. 
He redeems those actions. He takes evil and he makes it good in my life. He takes sin and he brings forgiveness and, and righteousness in the life of the repentant believer. Going on, First Chronicles 21, verse 7, it says this, God was very displeased with the census and he punished Israel, not just David, Israel for it. Then David said to God, oh God, I have sinned greatly by taking the census. Please forgive my guilt for doing this foolish thing. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 people died as a result of King David's sin. And God sent an angel to destroy Jerusalem. But just as the angel was preparing to destroy it, the Lord relented and said to the death angel, stop, that is enough. At that moment, the angel of the Lord was standing by the, thresh, the threshing floor of Araunah, the Jebusite. All right. All right. Let's review the three points we've had so far and look at, the, at a fourth. Number one, the Lord has good plans for your life. His eyes have been searching the earth and they've, they've locked in on you and, and he plans to, to uphold you and, and bless you and strongly support you. And he had determined that regarding King David. But the second point in, in review is that sin that seems insignificant isn't. It, it's actually a big deal. The third point that we've already talked about is that, that arrogance specifically is a grave sin. It, it's, it's nothing to, to take lightly. Arrogance, thinking highly of yourself. Pride thinking better of yourself than you do of others. The fourth point is our new point, and that is that your sin isn't private, meaning it damages others because you live in concert with others. You live among others. There's someone or several people who are invested in your life as you are invested in their lives. And so your sin doesn't just hurt you, it hurts those who, whom you have influence over and those who, who have influence over you. In King David's life, this was many, many people. 70,000 people died as a result. Going on in the reading, verse 16, David looked up and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between heaven and earth with his sword drawn, reaching out over Jerusalem. So David and the leaders of Israel put on burlap to show their deep distress and fell face down on the ground. And David said to God, I am the one who called for the census. I am the one who has sinned and done wrong, but these people are as innocent as sheep. What have they done? Oh Lord, my God, let your anger fall against me and my family, but do not destroy your people. Then the angel of the Lord told Gad to instruct David to go up and build an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Okay, there's that threshing floor reference again. Lock into that. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So David went up to the threshing floor to do what the Lord had commanded him through Gad. David said to Aruna, let me buy this threshing floor from you at its full price. Then I will build an altar to the Lord there so that, you, so that he will stop this plague. 70,000 people dying. Take it, my lord the king, and use it as you wish, Araunah said to David. But King David replied, No, I insist on buying it for the full price. I will not take what is yours and give it to the Lord. I will not present burnt offerings that have cost me nothing. So David gave Araunah 600 pieces of gold in payment for the threshing floor. David built an altar there to the Lord and sacrificed burnt offerings, peace offerings. And when David prayed, the Lord answered him by sending fire from heaven to burn up the offering on the altar. Then the Lord spoke to the angel who put the sword back into its sheath. When, when, when David saw that the Lord had answered his prayer, 
he offered sacrifices there on the, on the threshing floor. At that time, the tabernacle of the Lord and the altar of burnt offering that Moses had made in the wilderness were located at the place of worship in Gibeon. Okay, so God gives um, David this, this, this instruction. If, if, the, if the plague is going to end, here's how it's going to end. You're going to go to this threshing floor and you're going to offer me a burnt offering. I will receive it and, 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 and then the, uh, the plague will be done. And the, the angel of the Lord, uh, angel of death, maybe put, put the sword back in, in, in its sheath. Pretty spectacular story. Now, what is a threshing floor? Well, the threshing floor is the place where uh, the, the chaff, that is the trash, is worked out of the wheat. Remember, they're, they're agrarian. They're, they're growing wheat. They're farmers. Um, the, the threshing floor, it could... It just as easily be called the, the corn floor or the, the barn floor. It's where the farm worker, man or woman, would, would have a stick called a flail. Yeah? And, it would, he would, and he would do that. You know, he, would, he, would, he would flail, he would beat the, the, the crops, the wheat, in order to separate the useful stuff uh, from the, the useless byproduct stuff. And so the, the, the chaff would blow away when he would... When he, when he would flail on it and the, the wheat would be left and that was the, the, the farm, uh, the barn floor, the farm floor, the threshing floor. About the only thing I could say about it is that it, it, it was on higher ground, um, but other than that, it was, it was nothing special. This old threshing floor was the place um, where the curse of the Lord was finally quieted nothing special just a nondescript old old uh, barn floor but it's the place where the curse of the lord was finally stayed it was finally quieted it was finally stopped you see king david he could have just been glad to to make it out alive at this point he kind of has a choice he could have said well i never want to see this dirty old barn again He'd already paid for it, but he, I don't want to see this thing again. And he could have just left and just left that chapter of his life behind him. But instead, in this, this mundane, dirty old barn, place of business, agricultural setting, David realized this, realizes this is the place where the Lord showed up. And so for him, the trivial, this barn floor, it, it becomes the sacred. Is there something like that in your life? Something that's just been trivial, insignificant, unadorned, plain? But in some way, somehow the Lord showed up and, and the trivial suddenly becomes holy. First Chronicles chapter 22, then David said, this will be the location for the temple of the Lord and the place of the altar for Israel's burnt offerings. Now it's his son, we know that it's his son, King Solomon, that's going to build the temple uh, a few decades later. But David determines this is where it's going to be. I bought this spot and this, see the mundane and the trivial, it becomes the holy and the sacred. And my friends, he will do that in your life. He will show up. He will take the trivial and he will make it sacred. Sacred. What does that mean? It means that, that it is set apart for a special use. He will take the mundane, ordinary things about your life and he will, he will redeem them. And he will make them sacred, meaning that you are now set apart for special use. Point number five in today's study is this. You can't mess up the plans the Lord has for you. I mean, because the plans that the Lord has for you, they're based on his faithfulness, not your faithfulness. He is the redeemer. He is the holy one. He is, he is the one who will take the mundane and make it sacred. Point number six is this. The Lord is 
is a redeemer. He, he, is, he is always making things new. And he wants to do that in your life today. Friend, here's the good news of the Bible. We call it the gospel. If you've committed some evil act against another, another person this week, repent. Go to the Lord. The mercy of the Lord, the grace of the Lord means that he will redeem you. He, he will clean you all up. He will make you new again. You have been bought with a price. You are not your own. What does that mean? That means that Jesus on the cross paid the price, the penalty. Like all that, all that guilt that you have built up inside of you regarding the things that you ought to have done that you didn't do, the things that you shouldn't have done but you did anyway, all of the errors, all of the mistakes, all of the evil, all of that body of work that you have accrued that you're ashamed of. That, that shame that you carry, Jesus paid the price so that you don't have to carry it anymore. He, he, he paid for it. He, he bought your way out of guilt and, and shame. He, he, he bought your way out of prison. Uh, out, of, out of guilt. So now, now, what you do is you receive through the mercy and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you receive his righteousness. He has made, he has made a, a pathway out of the, the mess that you've made of your life, the mess that I've made of my life. He's made a pathway out. God is our redeemer. Uh, that means that he takes ownership of us. He is our redeemer. That means he takes what's, what's broken and he fixes it. He makes it new again. He's a redeemer. He is a way maker. When you think there's just no way, there's just no way out of this, God is a way maker. He is a restorer. When you think like it's too far gone, it's too broken, like a, like a car that's just a bucket of rusted bolts and it's just, it's just too far gone. That's my life, Randy. And, 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 and God is a restorer. God makes all things new again. You may feel old, like, like not, not physically old, although maybe you are, but just emotionally and mentally and all of the, all of the experiences you've had in life, you may just feel like old and, and God wants to make you new again. The Lord is making all things new. I'll close with a beautiful passage out of Isaiah 43. Here's what the Lord wants to do in your life. He says, for I, I am about to do a brand new thing. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness for my people to come home. I will create rivers for them in the desert. Oh, I, I, I invite you today to, to come to Jesus. You may think this is just a random moment in time. Maybe you've stumbled upon this YouTube channel and maybe you don't even know what you're doing watching this. I want you to know this is not a random moment in time. The Lord has determined that, that today is the day for you to come to Jesus. Today is the day of your salvation. Come to, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come and drink from the river that he has created. Come, come, come and walk the path that he has made for you out of the desert and, and into life.